Hello and welcome to lecture 7. Uh, in this lecture and perhaps uh, and the next lecture, we will see the proof of the cook levin theorem. Right? So as already mentioned uh, in the last class, so in fact we will do a short recap of uh, what we did in the last class. We saw what is NP completeness. A language is NP complete if it is an NP. Right? That is the first condition over here. And second, uh, all the languages that are in NP reduce to that language. So B is an NP, B is NP complete if B is an NP and all languages in NP reduce to B in polynomial time. So sometimes the second condition alone is known as being NP hard. Okay? So when you say and typically when somebody says a language is NP hard, that means that uh, that language just satisfies condition 2 over here. It need not satisfy condition 1 over here. Whereas NP complete means that language has to be NP hard as well as the language has to be in NP. Right? So just one small definition uh, which I just said. The second condition alone if a language is satisfying that is called NP hard. Right? And uh, another point again this is copied from the last lecture notes. Uh, NP complete problems are uh, can be thought of as the hardest problems in NP because once you show one of them is uh, in polynomial time, uh, all of the class, all of NP is in contained in polynomial time, right? So this kind of captures the complexity or difficulty of the class NP, right? And the consequences I already mentioned last time. Uh, if B is NP complete and B is NP, then P is equal to NP. And NP, uh, if B is NP complete and if B reduces to C in polynomial time, then that means that C is NP hard. So in, in addition, if C is in NP, then it also follows that C is NP complete. Right? Again, we went to went over this last time. Now let us, uh, after that quick review, now let us get to the proof of the cook levin theorem. As I already mentioned, this was uh, discovered roughly 50 years back uh, in 1970s, early 1970s, 1971 or so. So this shows that SAT is NP complete. That is the statement of this theorem is simple. SAT is NP complete. Right? So what is SAT? SAT is the set of all Boolean formulas that are satisfiable. Right? So it is a Boolean formula that can be assigned true false values in such a way that the formula evaluates to true. Right? And um, so now what is left over here, right? So how do we show this, right? How do we show that SAT is NP complete? So again, we have to satisfy this definition that it is an NP and all the languages in NP reduce to it. So that is one, we have to show that SAT is in NP and two, for all the languages in NP, reduced to SAT in polynomial time. Okay, So first we have to show that SAT is an NP uh, and, then the, and then SAT is NP hard which is what I have written in condition 2 and it so turns out uh, that this step is rather easy. Step 1 is rather easy and step 2 is somewhat involved. And uh, you will see why, uh, so in fact we already have seen that SAT is an NP. Right? Uh, you can make an arithmetic guess of the, uh, of the various true false assignments and then just go on and evaluate. And, the, and evaluating a formula at a given uh, assignment is not that difficult. Right? So um, part 1 is easy and in fact we have already seen it. Part 2 is what we will see now or we will start seeing now. Right? Now, how do we show that all the languages in NP are uh, re reducing to SAT? So we take an arbitrary language in NP and then show that that language reduces to SAT. Right? So arbitrary language in NP, okay, so how we will do that we will see very soon. So basically given an A in NP, we need a function such that if W is in A, then that function should map w to a satisfiable formula and if w is not in a 
that function should map w to a non satisfiable boolean formula right so this is what it means if and only if condition so we need a reduction function f such that w is in a if and only if f of w is satisfiable right f of w should be a this should be a boolean formula right so this is what we want to do and this function itself again this reduction should be polynomial time right so this this p at this less than or equal to symbol so this computation of this function also should be in polynomial time right and now the biggest challenge is so the goal is to show that an arbitrary language in np is reducible to sat but the language arbitrary language in np is arbitrary right so it is not like we reduce sat to clique where you know what sat is you know what clique is so you know something and so that you can transform or three sat to clique right or clique to three sat or three sat to subset sum where we know the structure of the problem instance given to us and we know the structure of the other problem instance that we want to reduce to but here a is a very unknown entity pretty much the only thing that we know about a is that it is an np right which means it has a non deterministic turing machine that decides it in polynomial time right that is the only information that we have about a right and we and we have to show that such an a is reducible to sat right in other words we have to show that all the np languages are reducible to sat so now how do you make a reduction that works for uh, all the np languages all the languages in np right there are so many languages how do you show each you cannot sit and prove the first language second language third language and so on right like, okay you take sat okay fine you reduce it you take clique you reduce it you take subset sum you reduce it and so on a three colorable and, and you cannot sit keep sitting and do it because there will be languages that you cannot even imagine which are in np so we need one way by which you take a general language in np which is what we have done we called it a and we will not assume anything about the language except that it is in np right so the only information that we have about that language is that a is in np so a could be a graph language a could be a language based on numbers it could be a language based on matrices it could be a la uh, language based on uh, boolean formula anything right all that we know is that a is in np and this is the only thing that we will use to show that a reduces to sat in polynomial time yeah, that is so you can see why um, like you are taking a general language and transforming into sat that is the challenge here and that is why cook levin theorem is is interesting because it it, it does something that is not seemingly uh, possible to do right so again this is what i have written here um, we have no information except that a is in np right and this is the only information that we will use and we will show that uh, show that uh, so a in np means that a can be decided by a non deterministic turing machine n that runs in n power k time so what is n power k here uh, n small n is the problem instance and k is some constant so it could be n power n power 2 n squared or n cubed or n power 10 k is some constant and small n is the length of the input right so whatever we so it varies based on what input input string is given to n right now suppose so now this is the only thing that we have that a is decidable in polynomial time by a non deterministic turing machine and from this we need to uh we need to arrive at a reduction and this is what we will use right so suppose n is the non deterministic turing machine let now let us try to write down what is n so let n be q sigma gamma delta qs qa qr so what are these this is just the notational in uh, representation of n capital q is the set of states of n sigma is the uh, input alphabet of n right so what are the languages that it can recognize right sigma um, so usually we let's say we have binary gamma is a tape alphabet so sometimes the tapes in the turing machine may allow some special symbols like some delimiters of course it will allow spaces because how do you denote that a tape location is empty delta is a transition function qs is the starting state q 
QA is the accepting state and QR is a rejecting state. So once the Turing machine reaches one of these accept or reject states, it is the complete computation is over and it has uh, halted. Right. So assume it's a one tape Turing machine. Uh, one tape or many tape, they are equally capable. Uh, in the sense that if, if it is polynomial time in multi tape, it is also polynomial time in one tape. Right. And let us assume that it runs in time n power k. Uh, that, so you, you actually need to assume that n power k minus 3 due to a small technical detail that I will not get into. But you can assume that it runs in time n power k. This is again by assumption. So states, q is state, sigma is input alphabet, gamma is tape alphabet. All this it is good to know, but uh, the most important thing is delta, which is a transition function. So, right, so I just quickly explain Q is a starting state, Q is accepting state and QR is a rejecting state. So what does the configuration mean? Um, so configuration we already seen in the first class. It encodes three things, uh, the state that you are in, the tape content and the head location. So basically if I am, I am stopping the computation of it or suspending the computation of a Turing machine and want you to restart the computation, what are the information that I should tell you so that you can restart from where I stopped. So you need to know the tape content, you need to know where the head was and you need to know which state it was in. So this is these three comprise of the configuration, right. right? So this is state, uh, head location. So I just write head location because we are assuming one tape not a Turing to machine and then the tape contents. And um, we will use a certain shorthand to represent the three things. So, so what I mean is let us say it is in Q8 right and with the let us say tape A, B, X, A, D something and let us say the head is pointing here right. The, the what we will do is to rep, so the head is pointing at A right. So now what we will do is to rep, denote the configuration in the following way. So configuration can be denoted as a just as a string right. So this is right. So you will write A B X and the tape head is at the fourth location. So in the fourth location instead of the tape alphabet, you will write the state Q8, A, D and so on. So basically the rest of the contents of the tape. So now there is only one symbol or one thing that is different which is a state. So you know this is a state and the other things are not states. So you know that this is special which means that the tape head is in the fourth location and the, the content of the fourth location you write, write in the next next position. So you know that the tape contains A, B, X, A, D and so on and the tape head is in the fourth location and the Q8 tells you that this is the state. Okay, So this is the shorthand for writing the configuration instead of drawing a picture like this and this shorthand will be used in the uh, proof of the cook levin theorem. Okay. Right. Uh, so, um, so what we will need, so again what we are going to use is that uh, A can be decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time or rather in n power k time. Right. So we will make use of this uh, notion called computation table. So the proof that I am presenting. Uh, or it is sometimes called computation tableau. This proof is there in uh, Sipser and it is also there in other books. And this is a uh, computation table is an n power k times n power k sized table. So you can think of an n power k times n power k sized matrix if that is simpler for you. So there are n power k rows and n power k columns, right. We have denoted here. So basically each, sorry. Each row here is a stands for a configuration of the NTM N. So each row is a configuration 
and uh, so you can see here so let's say you start so what do you start with when you start just to just to show you are at the starting state qs and let's say w is the input so w1 w2 etc are the individual symbols right and the head is at the first location and the configuration is exactly what is the configuration the configuration is the head is in the first location so the state should come in the first location followed by the tape contents w1 w2 w3 and so on whatever is the input string right so just let it is exactly the same thing that i have here in the first row this is exactly what i have here in the first row you have the starting state followed by w1 w2 up to wn and followed by this these things are blanks the the box type of things these kind of things are blanks it just shows that 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 place it's empty okay and for uh, convenience we also have a delimiter on both sides so there is a hash at the beginning and a hash at the end these two hashes form delimiters okay so the first row is the starting configuration of the turing machine n on the input w okay so where the input is input is w w1 w2 up to wn the length of the input is n okay so the first row is the starting configuration now suppose now this is the second configuration so what does it mean that this is the second configuration so now look look over here in this figure the head is pointing at w1 it is reading w1 and the state is starting state and here the head has moved to the second location and now the state is q8 right so this is q8 and the starting location now contains a so this means that this means that there is a certain rule in the there is that i'll write it in green there is a certain rule delta uh, when when it is seeing w1 and state is qs it will move to the right right it will write a right and it will it will uh, go to state q8 right so so this is what it means it will it will go to uh, it will so it will it will write a in the location which is what it is written here a uh, sorry we'll just i'll just underline here it is what is written here a it moved right so the the state moved to the right so the tape head location moved right and the state changed to q8 right and the next uh, row indicates that now it was it is reading w2 and it is at state q8 that means delta w2 q8 is equal to d q10 and again right so one small change this is a non deterministic turing machine so the delta function is not an equal to thing so actually we have to change it to the transition function contains this this possibility it could also contain other possibilities right so for instance if delta w2 q8 had let's say c q6 and left right then an alternative third row would have been maybe i'll just write it in red over here so alternative third row could have been this could have happened or this could have happened so instead of moving right it moves to the left right and w2 is changed to c so c w3 and so on w n right the rest is the same and um, it moved to q6 and a is unchanged so this could have been a possibility right so 
So again, there could be multiple options at each location. So the, this was a possibility, uh, right? So there could be multiple things. Uh, the main thing that we uh, make use of in this proof is that the computation that happens in a Turing machine is an extremely local thing, right? So when the Turing machine head is around here, right? The changes that happen in the configuration is just around the head, right? It's 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 only these three things that have changed. And so this is the thing that we will exploit here, right? So here um, the, the changes happen around the place where the head is or in the configuration, when you write the configuration as a, uh, as a uh, in this notation, it happens around the place where the state is. And this is a, only the place where the changes will happen. This is a reflection of the fact that the tape head can only alter the places where it is pointing it. So the configuration only will change at the places where the tape head is there. And this is what is going to be exploited here. Right. Um, right. So that is what will happen. And one more thing that I want to say is that we will assume that the configuration does not change after after halting or after accept or reject. So let's say the Turing machine computes somewhere over here and it over here it accepts. So now we need to fill up the rest of the entries with something but we will assume that it remains the same. The computation proceeds only till it halts, right? Accept and reject are actually halting states. So once after that, it just there is no change, right? Okay. So now, when uh, just let us try to understand when does this Turing machine complete the computation? It, we know that it computes in n power k time, right? Because it's a decider for it's a decider for a. It's a not a deterministic decider, but it's a decider nevertheless. So there could be multiple paths it takes. It, from the starting configuration itself, there could it could this could be one possibility, whatever I've written as a second row, but another second row could also be possible, and yet another second row could also be possible. But all of these are possible, right? And from the second from each second row, there could be more than one third row possible, and so on. But we know that if W is in the language, there is some way of a second a configuration, a third configuration and fourth configuration, etc. that can come resulting in the uh, Turing machine going to an accept state. Right? If W is in A, there is some way that it will reach an accept state. This is what we want. If W is not in A, then whatever way you try, it will not reach an accept state. Right? Whatever combination of configurations you try, it will not, it should not reach an accept state. Now again, the goal here is to prove that W is in A and from W is in A, you have to construct a Boolean formula that will be satisfiable if and only if W is in A. So what will be the Boolean formula that we will construct? The Boolean formula will try to encode this thing called computation table, right? this table of computations. And what it will try to do is that if there is a way to compute uh, compute W in A such that it leads to an acceptance, the Boolean formula will try to encode the situation in such a way that it will there will be a way to uh, assign values to the Boolean formula that leads to satisfying. If W is not in A, there is no way to reach an accepting state, then the, whatever you try for the Boolean formula, it will not lead to satisfying solution. Right. So basically the Boolean formula will try to encode this table which will be satisfiable if and only if W has a computation that leads to accept and that happens when N has an accepting sorry N uh, accepts W. Right. So basically the Boolean formula that we will construct we will call it phi it will check the following things. Okay. So, what are the following things? Uh, does n start correctly? Right. 
so which means is the first row does it correspond to the starting configuration right so that's what it means so here what i have written is the first correct starting configuration is the first row the starting configuration the right second is n moves correctly meaning each row is it a valid successor of its previous row right and n ends correctly which means in our uh, our requirement is that it should lead to an accepting state right leads to accept so these are the things that are checked by the boolean formula that we will construct so basically we should have a sequence of configurations such that this the first row is a starting configuration and each one of them is a valid successor configuration in such a way that finally it leads to an acceptance and this is what we want our formula to check and there is one more thing which is a bit technical which is that does the formula encode a valid table with one entry for each cell again this is a bit technical so i will i'll come to that when i explain the uh, way these formulas are encoded okay so we'll soon get to that okay so phi checks four things phi is a boolean formula that encodes all these things so corresponding to each one of these four things there are four things four um, formula and phi is an and of these four formulas phi start checks whether n starts correctly phi move checks whether n moves correctly phi accept checks whether n ends in an accept and phi cell checks whether the encoding is proper okay right now let us see how this uh, encoding is done okay so what are the entries of this table here and how do you encode this as a boolean formula right so the what are the entries the entries could be hash it could be states like q6 q5 q8 qs q start it could be entries symbols in the language like a c d w3 etc it could be blank spaces like right so we have the, the total alphabet of things that could go into the uh, go into the uh the on this computation table are this q gamma and hash hash is a delimiter it's an n power k by n power k table and how do we encode this as a boolean formula or boolean variables basically for each cell let's say this is this is the table and this is let's say this is the ijth cell okay so this is ith row and this is the jth column we have many variables corresponding to this location right so so the variables are x i j k right and this is set to true if the i j cell contains the symbol k and it will be set to false if the i j cell does not contain the symbol k right so x i j k is set to true if the i j cell contains symbol k and false if the i j cell does not contain symbol k right and for each symbol possible for each symbol in q gamma and hash we need we will have x i j that symbol so there are that many variables corresponding to a single cell i j and we have n power k times n power k uh, values for e, like i cross j i comma j right and uh, so now you may understand like i could have a bunch of uh, i and j i j k like i could have multiple k's that let's say that are that for which x i j k is true which will lead to an invalid um invalid encoding of a table or it's also invalid if there is all the x i j k's are false for all k's so we should have exactly one entry for each cell right so this is this is the point of having the fourth uh Uh, fourth component of phi, which is phi cell, and it is an and of all the four things. Okay, so let us just see the first three, and after that we will stop. Okay, 
The first thing is phi, uh, phi cell, as I was just saying. So this is to check whether it is a proper encoding. So for each i and j, right? So this is the outside and. It's a big and that goes over all the i and j. So for each i and j, we check the we check the entry in the in these brackets here. Right? Maybe I'll just make these brackets red. So basically, the, what we want to ensure is that for each i and j, exactly one k is true, and all the other k's are false. So the first part says that there is an or of two things. The first part says that there is at least one k that is set to true. So if this is true, that means that there is some entry, some k for which x i j k is true. And the next part says that there are no two two symbols for which it is true. There is only so first part says there is at least one symbol that is true. The second part says that there are no two symbols that are true, which means that at most one symbol can be true. So what is happening here is that for all k and l, we are checking that both x i j k and both and x i j k l x i j l are both not set to true at the same time. So if x i j k and x i j l are both set to true, then this will evaluate to false. Right. So you can verify that at leisure. So phi cell ensures that every cell is properly encoded. X meaning for each i j only one and only one entry is uh, encoded to be in ij right now comes phi start which is checking whether the first row is a legal starting configuration so this is not that difficult to see so all you have to check is the first row is a, a legal starting configuration so that is something that can be checked Right. So x11 one one hash meaning the first sim. So you can just see what, what we have here. The first row, first column uh, is hash. Uh, the first row, second column is qs. First row, third column is w1 and then w2 and so on. So this is what we will encode. Right. So x, the first row, first uh, column symbol should be hash and x12 should be qs and x13 should be w1 and so on until x1n plus 2 should be wn right so it started off with an offset of 2 so the entire w should end at the n plus 2 at location followed by x1n plus 3 must be empty which is a blank and so on until x1 and everything is a blank till the last location and x1 and power k and the last location is a hash symbol again. So this is just saying that each symbol the first 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 row first column should be hash then first row second column should be q start then the uh, starting uh, then each symbol of the input word w w1 w2 up to wn followed by a bunch of blanks and then hash right this encodes that the first row is a legal start and if i accept it's also easy we just have to encode that the whether the computation leads to an accept right so if i accept the simple all we do is check whether the accepting state is found anywhere in the table. So you have a big OR running over all the cells i and j or i comma j. Right, so and we check whether does the cell i j contain the accept state. Right, so this x i j q accept is true if and only if the cell i j contains the q accept state. Right? And then we check if any of the cells contain that. So that completes phi accept. So we have seen phi start or phi cell, which is checking whether the encoding is proper, phi start, which is 
whether the first row is that is what it's supposed to be and if I accept whether the computation needs to accept. What remains is phi move where we want to check that each configuration is a valid successor of the previous configuration. In other words, is the second row a valid successor configuration of the first row? Is the third row a valid successor configuration of the second row and so on, right? And this we will see in the next lecture. Uh, and in this, uh, in showing this, we will crucially make use of the fact that the computation happened happens in an extremely local fashion, right? So, if the head is somewhere, the computation changes will happen around the head, right? It cannot happen all around, all over the place. Right? So, we will break down the, 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 the checking into many small, small pieces because of this, right? And the details will come in the next lecture. So, as I said, there are four, uh, four parts put to five. If I sell, if I start, if I accept that we saw in this lecture and what we will see in the next lecture is if I move, which is the hardest part and the details of which I, uh, I will show in the next lecture. Thank you.